Welcome to the Justin Guitar Q&A session, Beginner Hour. Uh, so this is a chance for beginners to ask questions about problems that they're having on the course. So uh, first question today is going to be, as soon as I get a beginner's question <laughs> up on the screen. Come on, beginners, who's got a beginner's question for me? Um, somebody, Peter, he wants to break my fingers, that's nice. Um, Okay, what would be your typical student time to complete each stage? Okay, so that's a very common uh, beginner's question. So it really varies. Um, I'm running a, th this uh, kind of a companion guide uh, for three weeks for each stage of the beginner's course. But for most people, it takes a lot longer than that. Okay, so the average is anywhere from six months to a year. That's normally what it takes for somebody to complete my whole beginner's course. And, and that includes the consolidation part, which would usually take a couple of months, no matter how quickly you run through the course, you probably need to spend a couple of months at least um, just doing, uh, you know, learning the songs and practicing the songs that you, you need to consolidate that information because it's really important that your chords and your strumming and that sort of stuff is, is pretty solid before you embark on the intermediate course. So beginner's courses or your open chords, eighth note strumming, um, songs and the, the the basic minor pentatonic scale and all of the skills that you need to learn the kind of the skills of, of how to practice as well which is pretty important you know um, and then when you get to the intermediate course it, it's a little bit more fast moving so you want to have that stuff kind of properly under your fingers um, before you before you embark on uh, doing anything more than that um, so uh, in Fingerstyle DVD, that's not a beginner question as well. Anything interesting? Uh, there's always a bit of a delay here. Um, what are the chords? How to play notes and tuning? Well, they're kind of... That sort of stuff's covered on the beginner's course, and I'm not going to be able to uh, to do that, really, um, uh, to explain those, those questions. They're a bit big. Uh, C-sharp. Is it a hard chord for beginners? Yes, it's a hard chord for beginners. It's not one that beginners generally play because you can only play it as a bar chord. Um, the best way to play an A-shaped bar chord is taught in the uh, intermediate course. Uh, the difference between single coil and humbuckers. Um, it's not really a, a beginner's uh, question, I guess, but I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll try and do that one as well. Um, and actually, I've just forgotten... Uh, Tawny and uh, close to you. I'm just going to open up that uh, Google Doc page that we had before. Sorry, to uh, the, the live stream notes and ideas page, right? The one uh, uh, close to you. Remember, we were having a funny real time conversation in that the other day. So I'm going to just open that up. So if you guys want to paste really good questions that you see, if I've missed them, uh, you could paste them in there and hopefully I'll see them. I'll just move this over a bit so I can see it when you type stuff in there because that should be a really good idea. Sorry guys, this is only the second of the live stream so I'm still trying to kind of uh, uh, figure out exactly the best way to do a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, and now I've forgotten the question that I was going to uh, answer. Um, <laughs> oh dear okay i'm gonna pick this other one how do you avoid burning out when you're trying to learn a beginner song so uh some of the beginner songs are pretty easy so uh it is conceivable definitely that you can get a bit bored of doing it and and if you're not really enjoying it and it's really important at the beginner stage it's really really important that you're enjoying yourself you know so um, i'm in the middle of midst of tweaking the beginner course actually at the moment one of the things that's going to become apparent in the next couple of weeks is is the importance of having fun time on the guitar as well, where you don't stick to a practice routine, you know. So um, I definitely, definitely recommend that you you have some time where you're doing kind of regimented practice, like your one minute changes and, and strumming and that kind of stuff, where you really got to work on it and you use a timer if you can for five minutes at a time and you really do focus practice. But you also want to make sure you have fun time just playing whatever you like, you know, and that could be, trying a song that's too hard for you just because you really like it. it. It could be just jamming around. It could be more work on the beginner's course stuff if, if you're really enjoying it. But it should be whatever you feel like doing, you know, that whatever you really want to do because it's fun and enjoyable as opposed to, you know, I'm just a bit worried at the moment uh, 
you know, that I've offered a very structured course, but I haven't allowed much time in that for, for just mucking around and having a bit of fun. So, you know, uh, for those of you who are uh, just starting the course now and won't see the improvements that I'm making to it in the next few few months, you know, I think that's a that's a pretty big deal is just is, is really making sure that you uh, enjoy yourself, you know, w w when you're playing. So if you and the point of all of that is if you start to struggle with a song, skip off that song for a bit and try and find another song that you really enjoy doing it. And, and, and if there's something in the song that you feel like you should be learning, then you could maybe kind of put that in as a five minute set practice thing to be learning a particular thing about a particular tune. But really, I, I, I think it's a good idea to be trying to do songs that you really enjoy more than anything else. Um, so uh, can you show us your first song learnt? I don't remember what the first song I learned was, to be completely honest with you. Um, I, I, I just don't remember back that far. I was only six or seven years old. You know, I was a little little kid. It was probably something like row, row, row your boat or, you know, um, something very, very simple like that. So um, I'm sorry I can't share more with you than that. Um, should you practice standing or sitting or both? OK, that's also a very good question. Um, for most beginners, they, they're generally going to find it easier to play sitting down because you can kind of mm -hmm. nestle the guitar in against your body with your arm. And when you do that, it keeps the neck stable because what you really don't want is for this hand to be involved with the holding up of the guitar. That shouldn't be happening at all. OK, so um, I don't often practice. If I'm practicing, I usually practice uh, sitting down and I don't usually practice with a strap. But uh, if you're a beginner, using a strap can be really, really helpful because it can kind of hold the guitar against your body a little bit, you know. And if you're going to do use a strap, try and get it so it's um, so the guitar is just sitting off your off your lap, just you know, like you know, a couple of millimeters. So it's it's still touching, but it's not pressing down. Um, so I recommend that do it. You know, probably if if I was if somebody asked which one should they do, I would say sitting. Um, if you think you're going to be performing very soon, then it's definitely worth practicing standing up. And uh, definitely if I've got a tour coming or something like that, you know, I'm, uh, where I know that I'm going to be performing live, then I'd, I tend to do a bit more practice standing up just to make sure that it's not going to feel weird. However, I also make sure that the, the, when I set my strap height, that the strap is, that the, sorry, that the guitar is going to be in the same place sitting as standing okay so where my guitar is positioned in relation to my body and my arms right now would be exactly where it is when I stand up so it, it is a little bit high I'm definitely not doing the low rock and roll thing where the guitar is down by your knees you know I, I know that looks really cool but uh you know it I, it I don't think it's very practical um so I'm just going to flick on I've got a question there from Coca. Uh, is a music musical education essential when writing songs? Well, no, uh, is the is the blunt answer to that. If you want to be a songwriter, if you really want to write songs, then really education's not much to do with it. The real drive to write songs is is going to be the 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 most important part of that. You know, if you look at some of the greatest songwriters at all, they weren't. You know, Kurt Cobain is the most obvious example because he wasn't really a very good guitar player. You know, he. He was brilliant and I'm not, I love Nirvana, I love Kurt Cobain, but as a technical guitar player, you know, most of you guys that are finishing the beginner course probably have as much skill and knowledge as, as he had. And it's probably exaggerating because he was very good at what he did, but he was kind of loose, you know, when he played his E shape bar chords, he often played them as sus four chords. They were kind of, in, in, you know, if he, he did this all the time when he was playing a G chord, Instead of playing a G power chord like this, nice and clean, so just having those three notes and muting the thinnest three strings, he used his third finger as a little bar and he often had this note. But what that what happened when he did that was that kind of became part of the Nirvana sound. So even though it might first appear like bad technique, well that bad technique kind of turned into his style. And, and having your own style as a writer is, is obviously something that's very, very important. So, um, you know, that's one of those things where, um, you know, not having an education can sometimes be a good thing as a, as a, as a writer. Um, another good example on that front, who's technically incredible guitar player, but, but perhaps not uh, 
educated in the normal way is James Taylor, the songwriter, one of my favorite songwriters and favorite guitar players. Incredible voice, incredible songwriter, incredible guitar player, but quite unconventional. And the, the way he plays, like even open chords, like a D chord, he plays it with, uh, with the first and second finger swapped around, which, you know, it, it looks wrong to me, but actually there's nothing wrong with it, you know, and, and it helped form his style, the way he does these little hammer-ons and flick-offs, is, is quite genius, but it's kind of wrong and, and more difficult to do with a standard fingering. So, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it would be difficult for me to say that you have to have a, 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 standard, uh, a standard education or a classical education, you know, and sometimes maybe understanding too much musical theory can be uh, dangerous, risky. Um, it can help you stay inside the lines when perhaps as a songwriter you want to move outside the lines so basically no but there's definitely no harm in it and, and a lot of the greatest uh musicians and, and composers and, and and particularly improvisers like jazz musicians like miles davis or whatever very very well educated uh and and a lot of guys that you might not think are well educated actually are so um uh, a lot of the blues guys or whatever, you know, they, they, they really know what's going on and they've got a very, very solid uh, understanding of harmony and, and music theory and that kind of stuff. You know, music theory for a songwriter can be very valuable because it can tell you about the chords that are useful to play and all of that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, but it's not really a beginner's question, but maybe there's some songwriters that are beginners that that will be helpful for. Um, OK, beginner uh, question from definitely me. Is it a good idea to play in a band full of super good players? I play for like one and a half year and I'm not sure should I give it a try or I'm going to embarrass myself. So playing with people that are better than you is definitely the way to go. It's incredibly powerful tool for getting better yourself. So um, if you know some guys that are a, a lot better than you, then... Um, yeah, look, uh, going to jam with them and playing with them as much as you can is definitely, definitely going to be beneficial. So um, a lot of uh, when I first started playing jazz guitar, uh, I used to play with this guy called Phil McKercher, who's a, a piano player in uh, in back in Tasmania, still still there, still working. I went to see him last time I was back. He's still doing the same gig. And uh, I used to sit on the end of his piano stool with a guitar plugged into the PA and he used to call songs I'd never heard before and just go, oh, just play, just, you know, get along. And he'd play The Lady is a Tramp or something like that, you know, kind of piano bar jazz sort of standards. And and I had to kind of figure out what was going on. I didn't know the chords. I didn't know what the melodies were. He used to call me for solos on stuff. And, you know, it was a small piano bar gig and, and uh, he was an incredible musician and, and could kind of... Uh, help me out if I started getting lost a bit by hammering out the important notes so I could kind of pick up what was going on, you know. But I learned an incredible amount doing that. So, and when I was a kid, I was playing in a band. Uh, one of the bands that I, I, I learned the most in in my life probably was um, uh, uh, with a, one, a, a really good friend of mine, Nathan Sproul, who's a, a drummer. And, uh, and he was maybe three or four years older than me and I was in it all of the guys in his band were really good and I was just like the little kid in the band so I was like 12 years old or something and uh, we were doing some gigs and stuff and it was incredible for me to be playing with guys that were solid in the band and good, had good rhythm and stuff so I, I, I learned a lot about time and playing with the band and stage skills you know about communicating with the other guys in the band and that kind of stuff and I was definitely a beginner at that point you know I, I knew I knew my bar chords actually so I guess in my the way I'm grading the guitar, I was just starting to be an intermediate guitar player, but I definitely didn't know much about what I was doing and, and stuff. It was very good fun and I learned a lot. So yeah, definitely playing with people that are better than you, especially even for beginners again, um, is uh, uh, being able to play, have a jam buddy who's better than you is a really great thing. You know, if, you, if you've got someone, if you're a beginner who, you know, you can just play some really basic songs, basic songs, basic chords, uh, and have them solo over the top, and then maybe they're going to take a play some uh, some rhythm and let you take a solo and kind of help you along your way and and help you with your rhythm. It's very very valuable to have people around that are better than you that you can play with. Um, so uh, it's bad to start guitar with some fingering. I'm not really sure what you mean by that question, dear. I'm just kind of flicking uh, uh, round here a little bit. Would it be useful to record practice sessions from Ron W? Um, Definitely. Uh, recording yourself is one of the most valuable things you can do, even if you're a complete beginner. 
you know, a, 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 a certain thing that you should be doing if you're a progressing intermediate guitar player or, or beyond that kind of thing, uh, because you really learn a lot about what, what you're doing. And, and I find I still find it helps me playing. You know, often when I'm doing lessons for you guys, um, you know, I play and record myself, particularly for me singing, you know, I listen back to my singing, I'm like, oh God, that was awful, you know, Jesus, I can't believe I, you know, I, well, quite often, actually, I pull the stuff, if I if I do a video lesson and I don't do a very good job of it, uh, you know, I learn about my teaching skills, because while I'm watching it back in, while I'm editing stuff, I go, oh God, I didn't explain that very well, I need to redo that, so I just, you know, it ends up on the cutting room floor and I go and do it again, you know, and, and for singing for me, I listening back or, it, it, you know, still guitar parts. If I'm playing something, I think, you know, maybe I should have played that a different way and, and, and I'll go and kind of revisit it. Um, and definitely as a beginner guitar player, what you'll find is things like, um, you know, if you manage to a, a great realization for a beginner is if you're playing rhythm guitar um, and you're and you're working on your rhythm skills, uh, if you find that you're chords aren't quite up to scratch like you're still you know missing a few notes in in the chords but you manage to keep your rhythms good and you've recorded yourself doing that that can be a real eye-opener because you really hear that it doesn't matter if you fluff the chords up you know i can tell you and i've demonstrated in the in the live stream last week but if you do it yourself and you you can really hear that you um that it was fine then that can be a really really helpful um really really helpful thing um so uh, I have a digital tuner, but not sure how to use it. Would you show me, please, from Hacker, Hack, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Hack ER, I can't read it either, my eyesight's going. Um, uh, a digital tuner, I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not sure how I can show you a digital tuner. Um, I mean, the idea is that you, it should have some marker showing you when the note is in tune. So, uh, Hopefully you know the note names of the guitar strings. They're starting from the thinner string, E, B, G, D, A, and E. Um, so what you want to be doing is playing that note and then watching the tuner come to the middle. I'm just trying to think. I don't I don't have any digital tuners here. I, the, the apps I use for tuning, the one that I, my favorite one is, uh, this looks like this. Uh, hang on, I need to flick onto the other screen so I can see what that looks like. So is this, and this is the the Peterson I Strobo Soft. So when I play a note, you see how this is like because those lines are moving down. It's a little bit flat. Just wondering if I can prop it up somehow so you can see it, but that's going to be too low. <laughs> So now the lines have stopped moving, that means it's going to be in tune. So if I just do one, I'll knock it out of tune so you can see what I mean. So you can see I dropped it down there to a C sharp. But it's probably not a good example. Um, I'm just trying to see quickly if I've got another uh, guitar tuner app. I thought I had, oh yeah, I do, Polytune. So uh, we'll access, I need to access the microphone. So here's, here's the TC Electronic Polytune. Now this has two types. This has one where you play all the strings at the same time. And it's showing the me there that my A string is a little bit flat, but I don't think it probably is. Or is it the B string? Uh, same my B string's a bit flat. Yeah, that's it. So if it's uh, this side of the B, uh, when it's playing, because Polytune does all of the strings at once or one string at a time. If you play just one string, it tells you what that one string is. And if it's this side, you need to tune it up so it goes higher. And if it's if it's the other side, you've got to tune it back. Um, there are some lessons on my site about using a tuner as well. So you might want to uh, check that out as well. Um, let me just try and figure out how to get all of these things on the screen at the same time, so I can see what's right. Uh, Peterson's, uh, uh, what's the Peterson, uh, somebody's asking again what the app that I use is called. It's called the Peterson iStrobo Soft. Um, if you, if there'd be details on the Peterson website. Um, Clip-on tuners are really great. There's a lot of people they talking about snark tuners. Snark tuners are really good. A lot of my friends use them. Um, 
uh, yeah, I tend to just use the that the the iPhone, which I know is ridiculous. I'm using the phone as my main tuner, but um, uh, on my pedal board, mm. I, I use the TC Electronic um, tuner, uh, the Poly Poly Tune, um, and I also got another one called the Sonic Research turbo tuner so uh right now the turbo tuner's on there because my old tc1 died some of the leds went um and i had that one so i put that one on my board and uh, tc very kindly sent me another one but uh uh i haven't felt the need to swap it back yet because i hardly ever use it to be is, is is straight up um so uh okay we've got another question here from tom bailey uh, how important is it to learn a full song i only know two or four full songs okay so um, it depends. I reckon that learning full songs is a really good idea for a couple of reasons. One, uh, learning to play along with the original recording will teach you a lot, okay? And it's a really important thing to realize that uh, timing and strumming is not necessarily mathematical. So when you first start at the beginning and you're concentrating on your down, down, up, up, down, you're trying to keep your hand moving, maybe you're playing with a metronome and you're really trying to work it out to be, you know, exactly mathematically correct with a, with a metronome, but the, the truth is slightly different to that in that the, the, the idea of groove is, is ever so slightly not quite mathematical in a very human way. And that's what makes us kind of relate to grooves often is that it's not mathematically perfect. You know, if, if we wanted mathematically perfect drums, the, we already would have ditched drummers completely and we'd be using computers because computers can play mathematically perfectly better than drummers can. But there's something human about groove that is different. And the best way to learn groove is practicing along with records that have got great groove on them. So, um, you know, strumming along with, with, with stuff that's really incredible, that feels nice for you, because everyone has a different perception of what's really incredible groove, right? We all relate to different types of music more than others, which is good, the fact that we all have different taste. Um, so when you're playing along with the music that you really like, you're naturally going to absorb some of that groove, you know. So and, and if you're going to do that, you, you, it's better to play a full song, you know, so you can play along with the whole song and enjoy all of that stuff. Um, as well, if you ever want to play at a party or a barbecue or have a sing along or whatever, or you want to learn to sing, then you kind of need to be able to play the whole song. Um, what you don't want to be doing is playing away, you know, learning under the bridge and you've learned the very first riff. And then it comes to the verse and, and you know, they, everyone wants to sing and they can't sing because you only learned the riff at the beginning. You know, that would kind of suck. Uh, and that's a good example because a lot of people learn the beginning of Under the Bridge and they don't learn the rest of the song. You know, or if you've learned the rest of the song, you want to learn the very last part. The, because if you've got all the way through the song, everyone wants to sing along with that, the, the very last bit, you know, as well. It's a slightly different sequence. So I think learning full songs is a really good idea. You don't have to, but I, I would highly recommend it um okay uh so i'm just looking at this uh playing walk of life along with the record was pure fun for me although i just finished stage one but it, exactly so I, i'm not going to try and pronounce that russian word there that would be i'm sure i'd embarrass myself but uh you know uh yeah playing along with any of those sort of songs even if you're a stage one beginner guitar player it's so much fun to be playing along with the original recordings, you know, and that's one of the things I love about uh, Dance the Night Away by the Mavericks. You don't need a capo or anything. You can just jam along with that straight away. Um, the, the new beginner song that I just put up yesterday is this one, Blow and Smoke by Casey Musgraves. Very kind of poppy, not really the type of music that I would personally listen to a lot, but for a beginner, it's awesome to play along with. Really, really great because it's pretty much just A chord and D chord, one bar of each. And you can just do your four down strums on each song and you can just enjoy playing along and you don't have to worry about any other stuff. So I think that's, um, that's a really, really cool, really cool thing to be done. Um, okay, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Andreas Jonesson. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Sorry if I've got that wrong. Um, I'm thinking about buying an acoustic guitar for £500. Do you think I'll get a decent guitar for that much money? Well, um, uh, yes, you should be able to buy a very good acoustic guitar for 500 quid. That's quite a lot of money for, for an acoustic guitar, and I'd be very surprised if you couldn't find yourself a very nice instrument for that. Um, in that kind of budget, you definitely want to be going to a shop and playing lots. Don't, don't be tempted to go down to just buying one that a lot of people tell you is a good one, because particularly with acoustic guitars, you can have the same brand, the same guitar by the same company, and two of them will feel quite different, right, in, in the setup, because they're going to be, have had their final checks by a different guy, so you, I would really recommend that you, uh, 
and go to the store and you try plan a few. Uh, I think that would be a really, really good idea. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't have any trouble getting that. And I'm reluctant to try and tell you which one to get because I just don't, I don't know. I, I love making guitars, so I would strongly recommend making guitars. They've got beautiful guitars. Um, I'm not sure they've got one for 500 quid. They probably do. In, in the UK, there's a shop called Guitar Village in Farnham. It's a really great shop with loads and loads of uh, different guitars in it. Nice sales guys as well would be very helpful. So uh, uh, that would be a store I'd recommend that you might want to go and check out. Um, and I know they do make and guitars. They also do Taylor guitars. Taylor do some really nice instruments in, the, in, that, to kind of, in that kind of budget. So I, I, I definitely recommend uh, checking that out. Um, okay, a question from Mark Guitar. I find that my straps slide around on my back and shoulders and don't keep the guitar in the same position. Do you have recommendations for a proper guitar strap? Um, if the guitar strap is sliding around, it's, uh, it's because the strap's not tight enough because any old strap should sit i'm just trying to think if i've got any hang on i do have a guitar strap here hang on. whether it's set up for this particular guitar i'm not sure um, so one thing you know i talk about all the time strap locks i need to just get my camera right the strap locks really 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 good idea if you if you wanted to get a strap lock now this looks like it's for my acoustic guitar but oh no hang on we're good okay so the height for my guitar, if if the if the strap was too loose, right? So I just pop it on the longer setting there, because I'll explain to you later why I have a different couple of different lengths available. But anyway, if I have that's now too loose, right? And you can see that while I'm sitting there, it's going to fall off my shoulder. Without all, I have to do is just move around a little bit, and it's going to fall off. So it's obviously not tight enough. Okay, so if I put it back on the strap lock, okay. Now the height of this guitar is the height that I wanted at. So whether if I'm sitting, I can't really see it. Let's change it. If I'm I'm sitting, I, I like sitting cross-legged to play the guitar. But you can see now that if I sit cross-legged, the guitar is here. And if I uncross my legs, or if I stand up, so I get rid of the chair, it's pretty much in the same spot all the time, right? And that's how I think that you should set the strap. And it wouldn't really matter if it's a posh leather strap or a, a cheap strap. If it's if it's at the right height, it should just sit there. Yeah. Now I have I leave the extra slack on my guitar for a couple of reasons. One, I feed the strap through it, and I poke it around like this, so it just uh, helps keep the strap on. And as well, if I need a guitar to be lower down, for example, an acoustic guitar, that would fit on that lower one. So I can use the same strap for both. But I generally don't practice with a strap. Um, so I'm going to take it off now as well, because it means I can change my guitars easier. But um, yeah, that that would be the the thing to consider for using a strap. OK, let me go back to some uh, Q&A from the from the live room again. Um, see if there's anything interesting going on. I practice an absolute ton. The issue I have with bar chords is I literally cannot press down hard enough and play an F chord to fret any tips from Justin Johnson. OK, that's. Okay, but F chord is in the beginner course, so I'll, I'll, I'll go for that. Um, if, if you really can't play an F, the one thing that I've found lately to be quite helpful for a couple of guys that I've suggested this to is to go to a guitar store and try playing F chord on a bunch of different guitars because what that's going to show you straight away is whether it's the guitar or whether it's your technique. If you're practicing a lot, then F chord should happen for you, right? It's not that difficult to do F. It's, it's not easy, right? F, F is... It's not called the F chord for nothing, right? You know, a lot of people struggle with F chord. Um, but it's a really big deal that, you're, that, you, uh, that you conquer this one and you figure out what's wrong. So if your guitar has a very high action, and by that I mean that the string, the distance from the, between the string and the fingerboard is very high, that's called having a high action. F chord is the hardest chord to play if you've got a high action because it means the nut is too high. And that means that the pressure that you have to do to get the strings to touch the fret, which is what makes the bar, um, is going to be too hard. Now, uh, if you've got a really low action, like a lot of Ibanez rock guitars have a very, very low action. So if you found an Ibanez heavy metal looking guitar in a store and you went to play F chord and you could play F chord easily, then you know that maybe your guitar might need a setup and that would help. If you find that you still can't do an F chord on, on, on something with a very low action, 
an electric guitar with low action, then you definitely there's some sort of technical problem. So um, if you're doing all of the stuff that I suggest in the in the lesson on F chord about the rolling the finger on the side and where to, keeping the pressure on the tip and the bottom two strings, all of that stuff. I'm really not sure what else to suggest to you. It's not like I hold back some secrets about that. In those lessons on, on, on stuff like that, I really try and give as much as I can and, and use every trick that I've ever heard of or ever learned, you know, to, to help you guys do that. So um, that, would be, uh, my, that would be my tip there. Um, I like to, okay, from Cali, I like to record what I play and try to make songs. How do I get started in making songs? Well... Um, songwriting is a pretty big deal. I've got a few tips on the on on the the website there about writing songs and getting started. But basically, you just have to really want to do it. Um, and if you want to do an idea of like how to get started, um, the probably the best thing you can do is study songs that you really like. So find some songs that you really love, and and try and figure out you know how they're working, what it, it, what's going on with the verses and the choruses, and the, how they're structured and 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 that kind of thing. So. Um, that would be really the, the starting point if you wanted to get writing a song. But I, I'm, I've, I've got uh, a pencil for a, a beginner songwriting course coming up uh, later this year. So you might want to hang out for, for that as well. OK, um, Dave plays guitar. Should I get a guitar set up and restrung when you buy your first new one? So my answer to that would be probably. Um, it's very rare that if you take the guitar to someone who's good at doing a setup that it doesn't come back playing better, right? Uh, this particular guitar, when I bought it from the store, played great, and, and I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to take it for another setup, but it's a pretty posh guitar, and I would expect for this kind of money that it plays really great. If you're a beginner and you're going to buy a guitar that maybe hasn't got a great setup or you want to put light strings on it to make sure, kind of ensure that you have an easy time with your guitar, because light strings are generally easier to press down, then getting a setup is a really good idea. If you've got a standard setup, uh, with 10 gauge strings and you put nines on probably the neck's going to move back a bit and I don't really recommend beginners start playing around with the truss rod which is the thing that changes the angle of the neck um, I think you can see uh, you know in the end of that if you're ever wondering what that is that twisting that allen key round changes the, the angle of the neck um, so generally speaking I do recommend that you, it, it's worth spending a bit of extra money getting a setup you know I, I generally say that that for your first guitar that you could buy the best guitar that you can afford and look after it is a really nice way of thinking about it you know um so if you've got you know if you're a multi-millionaire you don't need to go ridiculous but you know you could spend a thousand pounds and buy a usa strat or something like that you know would be a great like an incredible first instrument but for most people you're kind of looking at a couple of hundred quid maybe three or four hundred dollars would be a good amount to spend as a starter instrument and then spending maybe between 50 and 100 dollars like you know up to 50 quid uh, but probably not too much more than that, to get a set up by a professional guy who sets up guitars. You know, um, if you happen to live in London, the guy that I use all the time is called Charlie Chandler uh, down in Kingston. I love Charlie. He's a great guy and a really, uh, you know, all of the guys in his workshop are really good at doing a setup. So if you went in there with your guitar and said, look, I'm a beginner. Justin said I should take it in to, to here to get it set up and make sure that it's nice and easy to play. They're going to be able to sort it out for you and it will be loads easier to play. Um, than uh, than well probably than it would have been and and actually a good setup guy if you take it in there and play it to them and say oh you know I'm a beginner I want a nice low action and I want it set up for that if it's already got a low action then they should probably just leave it and say actually this is fine man just go and do some practice you know that's what that's what I reckon um, okay is a bone bridge much better than the bone material bone bridge that much better than the bone material from Andre Brokman. Um uh, I don't know what I don't think any of my guitars have got a bone bridge my acoustic ones I think they're all plastic so I'm not really sure I've, I've never noticed that um, when I play I always end up with bad posture any tips on that yeah don't don't have bad posture St try and stay aware of it um, keeping a good posture I think is really important when you play uh, particularly uh, beginners and, and I was really guilty of this you know when I was learning guitar you sit on the edge of the bed with a with a you know maybe you guys are using the on internet thing so you've got looking straight ahead but I used to keep a book on the side so I'd sit there like this with the neck the spine twisted neck twisted and looking down and that's you know I, I, I have a few neck problems I, a bit of my spines kind of twisted out of line a bit you know um, very lucky to be going out with an osteopath, you know, so she can fix <laughs> fix my neck for me when it goes wrong. But, uh, you know, uh, you don't want to have to have 
big osteopath or chiropractor bills or whatever because you screwed your neck up because you were practicing stupid you know so as part of my beginners course i do recommend that you get a music stand so that you know if you're looking at sheet music or whatever it's right in front of you of course if you're using a computer it should be in front of you anyway um usually the big deal for people is they get tension in their in their shoulders and their neck uh, and it can be an interesting thing that uh, I learned it in Kung Fu, actually, when it, it, my instructor was always saying I had too much tension in my shoulders. And if you push your shoulders down and then relax, they tend to stay down. Whereas sometimes our shoulders are a bit higher than we think. And we think that there's no tension in there. But if you push it down, then relax, you'll find that they're a bit lower. So that can be one little tip for, for your posture. Okay. Um, uh, sa Salil. Chitra, I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Whenever I try to record my guitar strumming, I hear noticeable sound of pick. Is there any way to reduce the sound of pick? Am I holding pick or strumming incorrectly? Finger strumming is fine. Okay, so um, if you're recording your guitar, you, you are going to hear the sound of the pick. Um, it's one of the things that I find frustrating when I'm doing lessons for you guys, if I'm singing and playing at the same time. Uh, is that uh, I feed my guitar has a has a uh, either a microphone on the amp or I use a uh, this Kemper system the last little while. Um, but I've got a feed going from my electric guitar directly into the into the camera, um, and that records a really good sound, or from the amplifier or whatever. But the pick sound, I'm sure you can hear that already. You know that uh, even on electric guitar, I'm going to get that, and and you can't really escape it. Um, but one thing to remember is that thin picks give you a lot more noise than thick picks. So if you're going to use a really thin plectrum, which I don't have any sitting around in front of me to demonstrate, uh, but they're a lot noisier. They make a real click sound, which can be great for recording, actually. So, uh, you know, often if I'm doing a, uh, a, a, the kind of acoustic guitar part that's just sitting in the background of a track uh, and it's not really dominant, I'd, I'll deliberately use a very thin pick because I kind of want that percussive element of the pick noise. Uh, it's possibly more important than the chords, in fact. Um, so, uh, but if you want to get rid of it, you might want to try a, a bigger pick uh, and or uh, moving the microphone slightly further away from the guitar will also reduce uh, the pick noise. Um, Jim Maltner, any tricks to learning the up strum? I don't seem to be able to do it. Okay, very common problem for beginners is, is with the uh, battling the up strum. Um, and it shouldn't be because the down strum is no different to the up strum. Like if, you, if you can do this in front of your guitar, right, there's, there's no, you know, moving my hand up is no harder than moving it down, right? It's, it's true. A lot of it's psychological because we've got used to doing down strums and you think often down and then down again and you're forgetting that your hand has to move up in between so one of the tricks is just you know trying to keep your hand moving down and up consistently right that's a really a big deal so if you're practicing doing uh, it's a guitar pick here which i don't seem to be able to pick up so it, you know just keeping the strings muted is a good way if you're doing all your down strums and then just try doing down up like that I think that's a really, really good way. So just literally trying to do all downs and then alternating between down and up. Trying to keep the hand moving consistently is the key for most beginners. Most beginners that are struggling with rhythm, it's because they're not keeping their hand moving consistently. They do this. This, you know, I see it all the time with beginner guitar players. If they have up, up, like down, down, up, up, down. They're doing this sort of silliness, but it's just down, down, up, up, down. You've got to keep that hand moving, dead consistent. Down, down, up, up, down, 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 up, up, down. Okay, so very, very, you know, uh, important to remember that the hand is is should be evenly moving um, between both of those. So, um, okay, back to the room for a second. Um, uh, a few people are saying that the, the stream is boring. Well, I'm very sorry if you're finding a boring dude. Uh, either come back in a, in a half an hour when I'm in the open forum and not doing beginner stuff or, or just, uh, you know, <laughs> disappear. I'm not going to miss you. Sorry. Um, OK. Uh, yeah, trying to ignore trolls. It's always hard to ignore trolls. Just any anyone. Yeah, any of them. Um, just stick the band hands on them. I can't. I'm, I'd rather have just people in the room that want to be here. Um, okay, uh, how can I improve my finger style technique? I seem to pull my fingers back too much. Um, okay, this can apply for beginners as well, I guess. Um, for finger style is a lot about practice. Um, it's about trying to find the way that it works for you, I think, as well, because 
Uh, there are lots of different finger style techniques, really. Um, I, I found one thing that I found uh, very helpful for pretty much any type of uh, finger style is resting the fingers on the strings first. You know, if you just did um, something simple like that, so you got your thumb on the fifth string and then fingers one, two, three on the thinnest three strings. If you just sat there just going like that, you, you, you will pull them back quite a bit. I don't think there's like a, um, let me see if I can do it, move close up to the camera, but I need to see it before. You know, that's, that's fairly, this is difficult. You know, that's not close, but it's not far either. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if you're going like this, that's too far. But you remember with finger style, this part of your hand, this part shouldn't be moving too much, you know. Okay, there's not much, the, the, the palm of your hand's not moving, your fingers should be moving. Okay, so that, that would be probably going to help you not move your fingers too far from the strings if you try and keep your hand hand in place. But a lot of it depends if you're using skin or if you're using fingernails, if you're using long fingernails, uh, what style you want to do. Um, again, you know, sometimes if, you, if you're doing like a palm muti thing, like a... where you want this sort of thing going on in the bass, then you want this kind of part of your hand sitting on the strings to get that palm mute. But the other part isn't... So the, the bottom part's muted, but the top part isn't, you know. So it really depends on what you're doing. If you're doing very basic finger style, if you're you know, a real beginner and you're doing a, an Everybody Hurts or something like that. Um, okay, the big tree crew, the tree crew, what is that, the secret, is uh, not trying to move that hand around too much, okay? So just trying to keep... It's hardly moving. The actual back of your hand shouldn't be moving much at all. Okay, um, if you can, if you've got a long enough little finger, it can be very helpful to actually plant little finger on the fingerboard while you're playing. Now, I can't do it, which is kind of embarrassing that I've just said that, but my little finger's really short, right? Compared with the rest of my fingers. So if I plant my little finger, I don't have, I can't operate the other fingers because they're too cramped. Right, so it doesn't work for me, but a lot of the finger style guitar players that I really love and the really great finger style players have it use an anchor there with a the little finger. So that might be something that you can try. I can't show you how to do it or talk much about it because I can't really do it myself. So um, that would be something, uh, uh, yeah, something to consider. Okay, one more from the room and then I'll go to the, the Word doc thing. Um, uh, you need to know, okay, where am I at? Those questions. What kind of tea is best over in the UK? Oh, I like ginger tea. Uh, can I talk about bending? I often f catch the string above it with my finger. Okay, uh, I will make you famous. Bring that up again in the next session and we'll, we'll have a little look um, if, uh, uh, if you're interested in that. Um, what, at what moment do you realize you're no longer a beginner and more of an intermediate guitar player? Okay, that's kind of a decent question. Um, I mean, it, 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 whether you're a beginner or an intermediate player is completely arbitrary. And I and I have made a system, right, of, of levels of beginner, intermediate and advanced and whatever, you know. Uh, but they're just ones that I made up. There isn't like a set thing that says you graduated, right? Uh I think on my course, the way I put it is that if you can play like 10 songs all of the way through with open chords and can strum confidently, then you're progressing beyond the beginner level. That's kind of how I see it. If, if you, when you get to, it's mainly about rhythm, to be honest. If once you can keep a rhythm nice and solid and play a tune, even if it's just a few tunes, you're already moving out of beginner territory, you know. And for me, the dividing line is between playing open chords and playing bar chords. So as soon as you start embarking on bar chords, you're no longer a beginner. That's kind of where I see it. But it's just something I made up. There's not really a, a set thing, you know. Um, if 
but uh, yeah, having a repertoire of songs is also important because just because you could do the strumming, if you didn't know any songs, you know, I don't think that would kind of pop you in there. So it's, you know, open chords, being able to strum confidently and have a repertoire of, say, at least 10 songs. I think that would be a good kind of point. But whether you want to go into my specific details of mine and say, yeah, you need to know the minor pentatonic scale and you need to have tried improvising and have a have tried finger style and, and, and had got a little bit of experience with that, then um, I think that sort of stuff would be very helpful, at least. Um, Dumplings AB asks, how about nylon strings to ease finger pain when learning guitar? So, yeah, uh, nylon strings are definitely easier on the fingers. Uh, partly because of the material nylon is, is easier on the fingers than steel. Um, and partly because the strings are a lot rounder as well. Um, the usual problem with nylon strings is that the on a classical, because you normally find nylon strings on classical guitars, uh, and on a classical guitar, the, the strings are further apart. So having a wider string, a uh, wider neck, means that playing like a G chord or whatever is, is considerably harder. So... Um, that would be the disadvantage of nylon strings. I mean, I learned on a classical guitar. You know, that was my first instrument was a classical guitar and I learned all my chords. And But I remember really struggling like with G chord. You know, it was a real struggle to try and get my fingers that far apart. And, and I remember learning... Um, my mum had a Beatles songbook for some reason in the house and uh, uh, I, could pl I, I would go through and learn any of the songs that didn't have... that had the open chords in it but didn't have... Uh, uh, G chord and F chord because I couldn't play those two chords and then somebody showed me that I could play G just by playing with one finger and, and not playing the thickest two strings you know and uh, and so then it opened up the world of G chord for me and then uh, I can't remember at what time I just decided to man up and play G chord properly but uh, you know it, I remember getting an electric guitar and going oh wow it's so much easier to do all of these chords you know so I do you know if you've got an electric guitar with thin strings on it's not difficult really you know and and i kind of think it's more fun for the normal if there's any such thing as normal beginner than, than a nylon string especially these days where you can plug your guitar straight into a computer and explore lots of different sounds and stuff like that uh, other advantage with electric guitar funnily enough i was just doing a i'm refilming some of the those early beginner lessons at the moment and uh uh, this was all, uh, one of the things about choosing guitars and and a really big advantage actually the more I think about it is that electric guitars are very quiet so if you you know if you live in a flat or you've got you know girlfriends asleep and you want to stay playing guitar you can play electric guitar it's probably not going to disturb anyone you know so I th that's um that's my thoughts on uh, nylon strings um, uh, a Russian name that I can't pronounce I'm really sorry why are there amplifiers for acoustic guitar isn't it acoustic because it's not electrical. Okay, so uh, I quite often play with uh, acoustic guitar through an amplifier, um, and I'm quite fussy about my amplification brand as well. Um, in fact, I don't think there's even a company that comes close to the brand called AER. Okay, so if you're looking for an acoustic amplifier and you can afford they're they're not cheap, but they're fantastic and well worth the money. AER brand uh, acoustic guitar amplifiers. Um, there's a few reasons. One, if you want to be a bit louder, uh, than the acoustic guitar itself. That would be reason one. Reason two would be using effects. So if you want to use a lot of reverb or if you want to use digital delay or a looper pedal, uh, uh, that would be another reason to use uh, an, uh, an amplifier. Uh, if you're getting really into the, the acoustic, uh, uh, percussive acoustic, like modern acoustic guitar, like uh, you know, Mike Dawes or Andy McKee and that sort of stuff, um, using some amplification can be very helpful in in that particular style for the effects, for the delay, for the reverb, but as well you can play very quietly, you know. And, and I know I know Mike quite well, and he plays very quietly as a, as a player. So uh, you know, using so he doesn't, he, of course, he plays acoustically as well. But if he was p performing somewhere, he really needs to be amplified, or you're not going to hear it, you know. So that would be why there's such a thing as acoustic amplifiers. Um, and remember as well, if you've got an electroacoustic, i.e. you've got some sort of electronic device built into your acoustic guitar, you can plug that into your laptop as well and use the effects either in a you know guitar rig kind of software or a regular amplifier. Um, so that's those two questions. Back to the room now for a little bit. Um, uh, okay, uh, I'm trying to find a question there that's any good, but they're all just silly. What's my opinion of parlor acoustic guitars? I don't have a parlor type guitar, but I definitely like one. So uh, uh, 
at some point I'm very likely to um, uh, to get myself a parlor guitar. There's somebody that needs banding there. Stephanie uh, needs to get uh, <laughs> needs to get banned. Good lord. Um, Given unlimited time, how long would it take to master guitar from noob to guru? Um, well, I'm not sure that there is. A, no, I don't think many people have uh, unlimited time. Uh, but uh, the 10,000 hour one seems to be a fairly good random amount. I know it's just from that, that book. But, um, uh, you know, I think most of the guitar players that I know that are, that are pretty good have spent some time having a lot of doing a lot of practice you know uh in my teen kind of late teens i was de doing in fact i found a practice diary from from when i was about 17 or 18 and i was doing between eight and ten hours practice a day every day really well organized as well and all timed uh and i was pretty strict about it and almost every guitar player that i've met that that is really good has had a period i definitely don't do 10 hours a day anymore right um uh, if I'd managed to stick with doing 10 hours a day, I'd probably be like Tommy Emmanuel, you know, because those guys that are really that incredible seem to play that much all the time. They just don't stop playing guitar, you know. Um, I've obviously doing the website and stuff like that, and I have a life outside, and I'm interested in some other things. And the, the really great guitar players, the real gurus, because I wouldn't really call myself a guru. I can play, but, you know, um, the guys that I really admire, your Eric Johnsons and your Tommy Emmanuels and whatever, that you know, the the real technical, brilliant cats are, um, you know, they don't stop. They do 10 hours a day forever, probably more than that. So um, that's kind of where I think. But generally, if you, if you gave it, you know, six or seven hours a day for five or six years, you're going to be damn good, you know, if not, you know, excellent. That's what seems to be anyway. Okay. Um, what about left-handed people who learn to play with the right hand? Are they past beginner stage? Uh, one fret three, four, um, ask that question. So, I, I mean, I don't know about the left-handed thing. I'm right-handed. Uh, I really struggle. If I flip the guitar over and try and play left-handed, I find it very difficult. I can kind of do it a little bit. Um, if you want some more support from left-handed guys, then I'd go and check out the uh, the forum, the justinguitarcommunity.com, uh, because there's lots of people there that are left-handed. Some of them are left-handed and play a left-handed guitar. Some of them are left-handed and they play right-handed. So, um, you might get a bit more balanced opinion there about that. Um, uh, why do I have extra plectrum protection? A good question. It's just not. Um, uh, it's just not great for just now. Um, Disco Tam says, "Did you remember your bottle of water this time?" I did remember my bottle of water this time. In fact, I probably need a sip. Um, okay. Uh, uh, definitely talking for like this talking this for this long okay we've not got long left on the beginners thing so uh let me see what i've got else there um yeah i can see that uh well done whoever the j is i'm not sure who who's who's the j sorry i'm just a bit random i know but i can't oh somebody else who's just joined in anyway um okay uh I'm going to stick those first two questions. Okay. Uh, any advice on playing on stage for the first time? So, um, uh, playing on stage for the first time is terrifying, right? Uh, uh, there's people looking at you. Excuse me. There's people looking at you. You, uh, you know, it, it's a very new situation. Most of us get a bit freaked out when we're in a new situation. Um, the best thing that you can do to prepare yourself, well, there's a couple of things, actually, a couple of tips. First, be prepared. The more prepared you are, the less you're going to worry about it because what you don't want to be doing is worrying if you're going to muck this bit up or you're going to muck that bit up. If you've done proper practice and you feel confident in what you're going to do, then uh, then it'll, it'll go a long way to relieve the nerves, okay? Uh, second thing I found really helpful was practicing uh, going on stage in my bedroom. And uh, I used to, I studied classical guitar for a little while and uh, the exams for the classical school, the conservatoire, were pretty terrifying. There was like three or four, I think it was four people on a panel, and you performed in a concert hall with a desk at the front of the concert hall where the audience would be, but no other audience, and then just the four examiners. And you had to walk out and sit on a stool and perform bloody difficult classical guitar pieces 
for four people that didn't even smile at you, even though they were you knew them. Their gig was to be stony faced and not give you any hint about how you were doing, you know. And uh, so I used to practice for that. I used to I had a, a, a chair set up in my bedroom, and I'd go and stand outside and really envisage in my mind do mental rehearsal for the fact that I was going to go and play, and then I'd, so I'd be concentrating, and then I'd go out and I'd sit down and I'd play for these people. And I found that I could make, if I really concentrated on it, I found I could make my hands sweaty. I could make myself nervous by just being outside my own bedroom, going into my bedroom, you know. So this kind of mental preparation can be really helpful, you know. Even if you're um, if you're going to play for the first time in front of your family, you know, uh, that a lot of people get nervous about doing that as well. Uh, so one of the things that can be really helpful, again, is mental preparation, is imagining you going in and playing for them and them all really enjoying it and, and imagining a positive outcome as well. Don't go through all of the things that could go wrong. That could make it worse. So try and imagine positive outcomes and, and that it's all going to go well and put yourself in it because it's all mental. It's a big mental game, that kind of playing on stage thing, you know, um, and you will achieve your best if you can relax. That's a, a, it's a really important thing to remember is that when you're in a relaxed situation, you're going to do better. I often uh, make the jokey kind of analogy of, of trying to chat up a girl in a bar. If you, you know, if I go into a bar and there's a girl there that I like and I go over to her, and I'm all nervous. and I'm like, oh, you know, uh, hi, um, you know, I was wondering if you could make like uh, if we could have a drink or whatever. And you stumbling on your words and it all gets a bit, you know, you lost your cool. You got not much chance of getting anywhere there, you know. So, but if you're all cool and you go, hey, you know, you fancy a drink sometime or whatever, you know, they might not say yes, but at least it's a nice interaction. And and when you're performing or whatever, you want to try and keep that kind of level of cool because the audience are going to feel uncomfortable if you're nervous and they're not going to enjoy it as much, right? So trying to be just relaxed and cool and enjoying yourself is a pretty, it's hard, it, it, it's a very difficult thing to do. And we've had, talked about this on the previous live streams years ago, you know, that um, it seems to, evolve for me like the first time you play in front of your family you get nervous but once you've done it a couple of times it's cool and then you play in your first gig and if first time feels a bit nervous after you do a few it's fine then you get on to play in a theater with a few thousand people in it and that's you know that's pretty nerve-wracking but after a little while that becomes fine and then you play a live tv show it was one of the first live tv show i did what i found pretty terrifying um and uh, it was a, a Brit Awards show, if any of you in England would know the Brit Awards. And I played the Brit Awards with Katie Mellower and, and, and Jamie Cullum. And I, that was really scary, you know. Um, but it was fine and there was no problem with it. But interestingly, actually, some of, the drummer said that uh, he, he was feeling a bit tense for that as well. I think live TV is generally terrifying. Actually. I don't gen like live TV that much but I'm uh, filming for DVD that was a really bad one as well you know uh, playing live earth when I did that and it was a massive stadium of people that was pretty nerve-wracking although we were kind of enjoying it we were mid-tour and didn't feel that nervous but it was still a bit like whoa there's all these people man you know, it's a bit terrifying anyways um okay we're nearly up so I might have one more uh time okay here's a, a one a dog fl has got a good uh question there for uh finish off the beginner section which is an important question the muscle between my thumb and my first finger is really sore and it feels painful when i press into it what should i do so that's this muscle and this is the muscle that that works when you're pressing your fingers against the fingerboard right that's it's, it's just in there that's the muscle and uh, a lot of the reason when i'm t on the beginners course that i recommend that you keep your thumb at the back of the neck while you're playing chords even though any of you notice later on often if i'm playing chords my thumb's hanging around over the top right but on the beginners course i'm saying keep the thumb around the back and the reason is to start to develop that muscle because when you're playing scales and when you're playing bar chords you need that muscle to get strong so one of the things that we that I often talk about with kind of intermediate level stuff is is this movement between uh you know the thumb being around the back and the thumb sneaking around the top okay so that's another one of those things that i don't want to talk too much about in beginner hour but you know as you progress you're going to find the thumb keeps you know when i'm playing a d chord my thumb is touching the thicker string to make sure that string doesn't ring out but that's not good for beginners because we want to strengthen up that muscle to give them a better chance of playing your f chord and and and, other, and power chords and stuff like that so um it, if it really hurts, you just have to give it some rest. You know, you might have damaged if you've over practiced. So uh, if it really hurts and it's important to understand the difference between sore and pain here, right? Sore is fine. Like you've just come back from the gym and your muscles are real tired. That kind of sore is fine. 
but painful means that you should go to see the doctor. At no point on the guitar should you experience pain. Sore fingertips is fine. Pain? No, not fine. Take a break for a couple of days, and if something still hurts, then go and see a doctor. It's not really not really not worth it. So, um, okay, I think that's enough for the beginner session today. Um,